Bom dia, bom vindo na CEFA 2020. Nós estamos muito excited de estar aqui na Aoma Inta. For our guest, welcome, bem-vindos to the beautiful island of Aruba, and we are very excited to welcome to you to our island. So, my name is Rubiela Lampe. I'm from this beautiful island of Aruba, and I'm very excited to be here. And this morning, I'm together with uh, Mr. Kenneth Olson from the USA, with Maria de los Angeles from Peru, also with uh, Juana Camacho Otero from Colombia, and Kevin de Cuba from our island Aruba, and Mr. Ken Webster is live with us from the UK. Welcome. We're going to start a little bit with uh, introducing ourselves. Um, tell us a little bit who you are. So we're going to start with uh, um, Mr. Kenneth. Maybe you can tell us a little bit uh, who you are, what you do. Yes, my name is Ken Alston. I'm a founding partner of Circularity Edge, a consulting firm in the US which deals primarily with sustainability and circular economy matters. And uh, I've been working through my lifetime in sort of two phases. The first phase was working inside industry for maybe 20 years. <clears throat> so very much involved in implementing environmental activities inside a company. And then for the last 20 years, I've been consulting to industry uh, on the sustainability and circular economy questions. Thank you. Um, Maria? So, well, uh, thank you for welcoming us. Uh, my name is Maria Franco, I'm from Peru. Uh, I've been working in international development in, with focus uh, in agriculture. Uh, the first part of my professional development was in applied research. I've been doing life cycle assessment in the agri-food sector, and then I just moved to uh, work in designing projects, implementing projects, uh, promoting agriculture as well in Peru and along Latin America. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we will have uh, Juana from Colombia. Thank you, Rubiela. Yes, um, I am Juana Camacho. I uh, currently live in Colombia. I, I returned to Colombia after seven years living in Europe. I was finishing my PhD in design for the circular economy. Before that, I, was, I did an industrial ecology master's in Sweden and in Austria. And now I'm working with the, the water supply company in Bogota, the Acueduct, Empresa de Acueducto y Alcantarillado de Bogota, because well, we want to implement circular principles in the water sector in Colombia and, um, so, and in, in con context, in connection with also climate change. Um, goals. And before that, before going to Europe, I was uh, working in Colombia on climate change issues and biodiversity conservation, and that's when I realized that we need to move upstream in the um, production sector and consumption sector, and that's why I decided to go back uh, to go and study in issues related to what is known now as a circular economy, but it was industrial ecology. Um, and I'm a and I am an economist, and I have a, a first master's in, in uh, ecological economics. Thank you. Uh, and next, we'll have Kevin de Cuba. Yes, thank you. It's uh, great to always be home. So this year we are in Aruba, uh, Dutch Caribbean. And uh, well, I'm, I'm, I was convinced or got my eureka moment uh, after seeing a 50-minute documentary which is what back then was called uh, Waste is Food. And that's a documentary about the whole philosophy or the principles of cradle-to-cradle -cradle design. And after seeing that, uh, I got my eureka moment. And that was like 2006, 2007. And from that point, point forward, I decided, okay, I found my calling and this is what I'm going to do professionally for the rest of my life. <laughs> and that has evolved over time in deepening my knowledge and doing my homework in understanding um, creative to create in particular, but then it expanded to all the interrelated uh, schools of thoughts 
And uh, over time, uh, when Alan McCarthy Foundation started promoting uh, circular economy in the, you know, in the mainstream and in, in, uh, at, a, at a much uh, in, in the international level, uh, we found that circular economy um, serves as a as a good medium to bring all these this knowledge and thoughts together uh, under a framework that uh, I believe is a is a very interesting. Um, paradigm shift uh, that allows us all to rethink what we do, how we live on planet Earth, and how we interact. And uh, where I see the point, I see the, the the purpose behind it. So, if you ask me why we are all here together about uh, talking about circular economy, it's all about finding ways to for us as human beings to thrive on planet Earth without. <laughs> impacting it and impacting our own future ability to survive and to, to thrive on the planet. And I think that circular economy brings all together in a holistic, integrated way. So that's from my, my take on it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kevin. Um, let's hear from Mr. Ken Webster from the UK. Can you introduce yourself? Very much, thank you for the invitation. I hope I can be heard okay through the system. Uh, my work started in, in this area when I helped found these, uh, in the um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation. I was invited to uh, provide some of the background uh, thinking uh, and uh, support the energies of Ellen MacArthur and the small team at the time. So I was head of innovation through to 2018, and the last couple of years I've spent time uh, between two universities, uh, the um, University of Exeter, Business School and the University of Linköping in Sweden. I'm also director of the International Society for Circular Economy. Thank you. I'm going to briefly tell you about myself. So I'm Rubila Lampe. I live on this beautiful island of Aruba. And in Aruba, I manage an engineering firm. Um, basically, uh, we do several projects in industrial and also um, commercial projects in Aruba and also the neighboring islands. Okay, so basically, I think we're going to start off by asking why circular economy? Why is it important? Why is it important uh, for the world, for the islands, for all of us? I think that's the key question to start with. Um, I think we can start with Maria. Sure. Well, well, as Kevin was good saying, is there are so many concepts, so many definitions that circular economy can definitely uh, take and put it in a single or in in a general definition. Um, in my side, and for example, in agriculture, we definitely try to. Um, to connect, for example, to all the value change and to try to, to use this concept of gener generative agriculture. Um, and then that's we, uh, this is why much more or less um, we, can, we can work. Maybe can, Kenneth can introduce some fundamentals, maybe. Sure. Well, for me, I think we have to differentiate first between a concept and than the complexity of the real world. For me, concepts are simple because they're, they're there to give you, as Kevin said, the paradigm shift, to make you change the way you think. And so I think back to what 33 years ago when we had the first definition for sustainability or sustainable development. And it was, again, a short definition, but making us think about future generations and not doing things now that would impact negatively for future generations. And so it was a way to change your thinking. And then we started talking about three E's. So there was economics, environment, and equity. So we, we weren't only thinking about money. We had to think about society. We had to think about the wider environment. And these were all little concepts and ideas to change the way we think. And I think circular economy started the same way. It's like, hey, we've got, to, we've got to get out of this idea that we take things, we make things, we sell things, buy things, use things, and then we throw them away. And this is a linear flow, and we've learned 
but it's not sustainable. And so if part of the goal is to become sustainable, then we need to rethink things. And so this idea of not having the linear flow, but have a, a circular flow, as happens in nature, um, this is where sort of the beginnings of circular economy came from. But again, it's, it's a concept. So first of all, we get the idea that something has to change from linear to circular. But then we have to put it into practice. And it's this is a whole hours. different discussion from the concept. Because the real world is complex. We have manufacturing with very complex global supply chains, very interconnected. And you can't just say, OK, go circular. You know, it just it isn't that simple. So I, I would start by saying, have an awareness and learn about the concept and change in thinking. And then we have to go deeper and deeper so that we can then put it into context. So it may be a water context, it may be an agriculture context, it may be an industrial manufacturing context. And then within that context, it may also be within a country or a city. Um, and so we have to look at it at all of these different scales. And that's, that's what the complexity that we have to work through as we move into implementation, which is the next phase after the enlightenment of awareness. Yes, that's true. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I think with time, you see that a lot with the younger generation, with the kids. They are more aware than maybe our generation many years back. They are more aware of the environment and also how to preserve our resources, and I think that's a good start. If I may, I think um, I think we all grew up with a with a very significant environmental awareness. I I, I think so, and that's why we are working on the on these topics. And yes, that's the first step that we need to implement different uh, development models, but. What I've seen in my, I don't know, 20 years of experience is that, yeah, we had these younger generations 20, 30 years ago, and today we're having bigger challenges maybe than 30 years ago. So what happened throughout that, our lifetime as adults that didn't let us realize all those dreams of uh, sustainability? And I think that's about structural change. So. Education is very important because you need to have these kind of values, that environmental values that um, make, could help you make more sustainable choices. But we also need to, to have a structural cha change in how we produce things, on how we consume things, how we transport things. And that's one of the, the things that, I, that makes the circular economy concept very uh, successful, maybe, because it it is trying to change the mindset from a linear to a circular perspective, but it also address, um, presents the, the, these new ideas in a context of efficiency, which is what drives these structures, these social structures in the Western world, let's say. So, uh, so the circular economy comes about from that need of Okay, we need more resources, or we need, we have, um, we have needs. We have a growing population in the developing country that has, let's say, more sustainable consumption patterns, so far. But we are more people, and we need to lift people from out of poverty. So we're going to need more resources. So we need it to do it efficiently. But we also have consumption patterns in the developed world that are very intensive in materials, and we need to make those consumption patterns more sustainable. Not just efficient, but sustainable. So I think the, the circular economy as a concept, not as a practice, because that's a different thing, uh, can help with that. Or it was, create, was thought to, to help with that, how to supply those needs in an efficient way. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, Mr. Kim, you want to share a little bit more on this topic with us? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's very interesting to hear the perspectives so far. But there's been a bit of research by um, Borello, Pascucci, and Cambalo in uh, their, their Italians, but some of it's done in Exeter. We said there are three indisputable insights 
This is from a review of all the, the literature. And th these three are as follows. It is um, an umbrella concept. It brings together other schools of thought like cradle to cradle, the blue economy, natural capitalism, and so on, about six or seven of them, but elaborates them in a narrative which is able to inspire policy action. Now, this has been very successful. In other words, it's a deliberately engineered reframing of the, of the concept uh, at around 2010-12, it already existed, but it was a repositioning of it to inspire policy, but also to inspire business. It's a social technical transition using innovative industrial systems. Walter, Walter Stachel always says the circular economy is an economic opportunity driven by innovation. So it's the idea we can do things differently at uh, and still make money, still make a, a, a business run, but um, it's also got another level to it, which I think is being hinted at already. It's not an efficient approach, actually. It's not efficiency. It's effectiveness. And, and there's, a, there's a difference in English. It may not be quite the same in Spanish or whatever. But efficiency is not enough. Uh, living systems, living uh, ecosystems, organisms, or whatever, are effective, not just efficient. In other words, they have an interplay between efficiency and resilience. And this is really quite a key difference. And so that's why Brown, Garten, McDonough, Cradle to Cradle would say, we have to celebrate diversity because diversity uh, hints at the creativity and resilience, uh, which, which is so important to, to an, an evolution in this direction. So we want to design, not just allow, but to design industrial systems, which are eco-effective, not just efficient, because efficiency is, if you like, still, just trying to do less harm. Kevin will recognize all this terminology uh, from cradle to cradle, and uh, to go beyond less harm to a positive cycle. Now, why is that so important? You might think it's just um, playing with words, but what I think captures the imagination about uh, circular economy, and was the same with cradle to cradle, is it's not about doing less harm. It's about uh, living and working and producing, consuming and exchanging in a modern world, not to go back to 1820. I mentioned 1820 because the building I'm in at the moment was built in 1819. Uh, but to, to be able to live well in a modern world. And I think that is part of the key to making it very attractive in a policy sense. It's not about going back. We don't use words like degrowth. We don't use words like, well, uh, you know, do with less. What you do is design products and services so that they can be enjoyed, but they are nutrients for the whole system. Now that's, I think, part of why it catches the imagination if it goes that far. For some people it's just, well, we used to do recycling, so we'll do more of it and call it a circular economy. That, you know, that's, you get a lot of bandwagon jumping uh, in that way. But this research suggests that these three elements about being able to inspire business and policy, about an innovative uh, transition, and that it's about eco-effectiveness, taking insights from living systems, characterizes, and that's what they say from the research, uh, the umbrella concept of circular economy. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Yeah, I wanted to to jump into what Ken just mentioned. Um, I think that the key word uh, you mentioned is eco-effectiveness. Um, I've noticed that throughout the Latin American region, after working for more than 10 years, um, there's a growing group that uh, easily or quickly auto-denominates their activities as circular economy. While in essence what they're doing is simply recycling 2.0 or simply trying to improve efficiencies within their existing systems, whether it's a supply chain or whether it's uh, within the, the own business, I mean, a, a fabric or, or a uh, industrial activity. When, what I mean with that is that you, you are right, Ken. It depends on the words that you use, the terminologies, the language it has a lot of impact on uh, bridging that gap of knowledge and understanding. 
and I hear a lot of people saying, ah, yes, I'm doing a cleaner production initiative, and that's why it's circular economy. And if you hear, if you carefully listen to the word cleaner production, you're already indicating that what you're doing is simply continuing what you have been doing, but trying to do it more efficient, or try to reduce the amount of emissions, reduce the amount of uh, uh, waste water uh, generation or whatever it is. And while the conversation should evolve, if you talk about conceptual aspects, like the, the utopic goal you want to reach versus the reality, I understand there are two, there's a spectrum between that. But if you really want to come to circuit economy solutions that are compatible with these principles, you really, you are forced to rethink your whole product from the micro level all up, up, uh, up to your business model. If you don't do that, it's just wastage of your time. And that's my, my opinion, right? For me, it's like I don't, I don't like to de dedicate or waste my energy and time on things that I know ahead of time would not lead to that overarching goal. So there is where we all have to be very critical about when we engage, when we talk to our colleagues, and also uh, not just let anybody just how to denominate their activities a circuit economy, because they are not. And we have to be able to make a distinction between one and the other without saying that the other is bad, right? And Ken and I have had many uh, exchanges about this. We're not saying that one is better than the other. It's just there are different things, different ways of solving, of aiming to solve a collective problem. But you cannot just put everything on the same heading. And that is uh, important. And I see this evolving in this region to an extent that it, it might lose the value. We use the integrity of the word circuit economy. And, and then it will become another nice buzzword over time. So if we really want to make the change, we really have to be adamant about what we do, how we uh, critically validate them and there should be somebody at the global level that actually has the ability to <laughs> to certify or, or confirm yes this uh, some an idea a solution that fits within this overarching work um, in order to really uh, direct our noses to the same direction I see Juana well, wanting to give her opinion so <laughs> I'm waiting for your ob observation <laughs> um. Yes, I wanted to, to respond to that because I have the privilege to have worked a lot in policy making and research for the past seven years, but now I'm working on implementing uh, circular economy and I realize how difficult it is because especially, because we have, uh, Ken was mentioning, is a new socio-technical system and, and that's a, a set of, uh, materials that have come together and have been built over, I don't know, two, 150 years of history of our industrial system. So the change is very, very challenging because we not only have to change the, the, the material part of it, but also the rules, the mindset, blah, blah, blah. So I agree that we have to make sure that we are not labeling everything or anything as circular our economy, but in our countries, especially where we don't, we haven't even reached the point where recycling is a thing. Then it's very challenging. It could, one, one may think it's very challenging to go all the way into the circular economy, but I also have thought about the leapfrogging. We we should uh, leapfrog towards circularity because, uh, although Ken says that is not going back to the 1920s. If you look at the history of development, back then there were, in, in times of scarcity, there were practices that were very mindful of how we used materials. And that's something that I found in my research that these kind of practices are, especially in developing countries, are connected to times of poverty, times of scarcity, and that's why it's a bit difficult to, to promote it between uh, among consumers. But uh, because developing countries are coming out, um, um, are starting a development path that started a little bit from, from scarcity, we still have practices like repairing. They are still a bit, uh, 
spread out, uh, repairing, um, reusing. So we need to find ways of reframing these activities that are already established in our, in our societies and bring them to the new circular economy era. So uh, my point was basically that although we cannot brand anything or everything as circular economy, we need to be mindful of our uh, context and our implementation capabilities. Because it, for example, in the Aqueducto and my water, the water supply company, we, we, don't, we only treat 30% of the wastewater of Bogota and we're gonna start treating the other 70% in the next five years. So, but we were not thinking about the circularity process. A little bit, yes. So there are, the, the design has inclu it includes a little bit of circulation and, and co-generation, energy co-generation, but the, 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 the plants were not thought designed in that way. So now we're gonna be stuck with, uh, with these plants for 25 years, so but then you need to bring F circularity efforts in some way. So the scale is going to be small, but it's going to happen. So implementation is very difficult. So when you think about it, you need to think about those restrictions. Thank you. So I think if I can build on everything that's been said, I think it's not either or, it's both and, right? And so I think you have to be both eco-efficient and eco-effective to Ken Webster's point. Because eco-efficiency on its own is insufficient, Ken is right. Because this is what we've been doing basically to deal with sustainability. We've been trying to be less bad, we've been trying to use less stuff, we've been trying to make things go further. And it, on its own it's not enough. But it doesn't mean to say you don't do that. So you do do all of that and you do build on what exists, but you have to go further as well. And, and this, is, this is the challenge. You have to reimagine the future at the same time that you stay in business. And this is why you have the challenge in business. I, I had the same for 20 years working in the area. How do you reinvent your business and make it circular at the same time you make your money when you're in the linear? And it's, it's a tricky transition, but it's, it's both, not, not either or. Yeah, in terms of complex as, uh, as well, uh, I want to point what uh, Ken says, uh, which is um, not only efficiency, but as well resilience, and also to add to that the concept of diversity. So it's like, okay, we work on efficiency because we, we really need to, to have uh, livelihoods or, or, to, or to, you know, to be sustainable in life, but also what about for example, the resources that we are using, and then what about depletion of soil, watershed? So there, there are concepts that, that little by little are being getting involved with, in the equation, and then, and then which diversity is something very, very important. Maybe we can go uh, in deep later about this topic, but yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's something that to take into account. Thank you. I think uh, one challenge, maybe you guys know that um, Aruba is a small island and for sustainability is already, I think, uh, not, we are not totally there yet, but um, I'm very interested in the circular economy. How um, do you think we can start uh, this on the island? What are areas that are easy to start with, uh, with awareness or projects? What's your thought on this topic? for the islands. It's not only Aruba, I think many Caribbean islands, um, they face the same challenges, um, mainly, for example, in waste management also, it's, it's a challenge. But what are your recommendations based on your experience on this topic? Who should start? Um, I think the first step to understand the potential for circularity in a, in a place and an island is a perfect uh, starting point because the, the boundaries are very clear, is to understand the flow of materials. And uh, so what comes in and what goes out, and there you, need, you, you can find opportunities for circul closing uh, cycles within the, the, the island. For, so for example, food. Food is a good place to start where you, where you, you, you bring most of your food from outside maybe and then but what happened with the organic 
waste? Do you throw it in the ocean or do you compost it and do you have local farming? So how can you uh, close that circle? Or for example, uh, water. I know you use uh, desal desalination. Uh, actually, we use RO plants. Exactly. Reverse osmosis we use. But for example, yeah. exactly. So you have that, and then what happens with the wastewater? Does it return to the to the ocean, or can you use it for thing to reuse it or recirculate it in the island, for example, with water uh, for toilets or or um, watering plants or cleaning the the streets for us in the in Colombia, we have a challenge with re, water reuse, reuse, and I think it's a low-hanging fruit that we could use, and all, but and you also as well. So water, food are good in, uh, starting points, but first you should in, understand what is the material flow of the island. What is been working very good in Latin America are those uh, small projects that are funded by the government, maybe some startup projects, some startup initiatives that have been working that are related to food, they are related to uh, waste management, uh, where, for example, uh, people that are interested can apply and also what they do is to identify a specific, pro a specific problem and a specific challenges. In Peru, they've been working, for example, a project named um, Simba, which is Simbasura, uh, which is without trash, for example. They, are work they identified a specific uh, challenge uh, uh, along Lima, which is, for example, the food that uh, porks. This, this sector has been, has been uh, consumed, for example. And then what they do is try to to collect all that trash and to convert and to produce uh, proper food for, this, uh, for these animals, uh, within a creating a new value chain. You know, this is something that has been, this is a specific project and a specific challenge, but has been, and, and it's been developing for the last two years, but, and with this specific food se sector problem that has been work, is, is worth, but behind that, you know, the back, uh, the, should be, you know, supported by some, some institutional organization, some funded project that maybe can, you know, support them during the beginning because it's been sustainable, but at all it needs some support. This is one, one specific example that can be, that can be worth. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Could I add something? Yes, go ahead, Ken. Okay, thank you. Uh, when you're not in the room, it's hard to pick up cues as to when you should speak or not. So forgive me. Uh, there are a couple of great examples around of islands doing interesting things. And why these are perhaps important, of course, is that they can illustrate how you can uh, save a lot of time by not having to rethink uh, everything. Uh, I was thinking of uh, Hiera in uh, the Canary Islands. They have built over 20 years, almost a new economy around looking at not just yeah what, what flows in and what flows out, but how they could add value. Uh, I think this has been hinted at a little bit, add value with what they have, but by changing the fundamental infrastructure around energy, they're able to create a lot of cheap energy, which allowed lots of new businesses to thrive. They also developed a new a different approach to preserving fisheries, which didn't, which had, uh, uh, the, the principle was you don't catch the big fish. In other words, if you do catch the big fish, you put them back because it's the big fish that are the source of most of the new fry. So they got a, a different approach to how they would do fishing. A lot of it was built on internal discussions. So it's finding, finding your own way, but it did have an overarching plan, which was to add value with what you've got, shift to renewables, create surplus that would allow other sorts of investment to be brought along. They're very much moving towards having uh, an electric car fleet rather than traditional car fleet, because one of the problems was importing diesel and uh, fuel. So Hierro in the Canary Islands, I think is a great one to look at. Uh, it's localized, it's for their problems, but they've had lots of experience in thinking through how loops can interconnect, if you like, how one uh, waste can become food for another system. And it does require 
a bit of an overview. People have to, in a sense, buy into the idea of this transition. Otherwise, there is a danger you just do lots of little initiatives and hope that people smile a lot about it when fundamentally you're not changing anything. You're just doing less harm again. Nothing against that, of course, but uh, it's often what's missing, I feel, is the sense of overall direction. This is where we want to get to. And that gets substituted for this is what we can probably do at the moment. So there is that, that gap. Uh, but it's a really, uh, islands are the places where you can get this right, I think, because as mentioned, you've got these boundaries. Thank you. I think, I think you have a, a good start in that you already have a circular economy roadmap for Uruma, something that we worked on a few years ago when I was here last. And so I think there is some, you know, there's some good thoughts that you can look at and say, okay, so what does that mean for us? It's, it's a sense of direction. Um, you know, you have a, a high reliance on tourism. So what can we do about the tourist experience that begins to take these ideas into account? The more tourists you get, the more materials get used. And so what are the material flows around tourism? So you can look at you know, it sector by sector. Um, and you, we can certainly look at you know, more local food production. But I think, I think this idea of, of building your resilience um, is a good place to start. Well, as a local, and maybe I'm a bit extreme in my way of thinking and, and, and ambitions, but if you think about an island like Aruba, what do we actually have as resources? Next to the, the nice beach and the beautiful ocean and the nice weather, <laughs> uh, uh, what else do we have? The only thing I can come up with is ourselves, we, our own people, our human capital that we have on the island. And if you ask me, if you want to go towards a sustainable uh, circular island economy, uh, we have to really invest in our knowledge, our intellect. Uh, we have the beautiful, uh, yeah, unique opportunity to get access to the best universities around the world. Uh, our population is relatively well educated and uh, we speak many languages. You know, we dominate all four languages at least and we have the affinity with the Europeans as well as with the Caribbean and the Latin America. So we have unique features as, as an island, if I'm referring specifically to Aruba. And there's where we need to put our you know, investment in, like uh, go towards education and also being on the front end of cutting edge um, research. Uh, research in the sense that I'm asking myself, uh, we all are deploying uh, solar panels around the world, right? And Ken and I are involved in a project uh, uh, with, with the US government, where only now they are thinking about, oh, damn God, after 30, 40 years of deploying all these uh, solar panels all around the world, now they are going to become hazardous waste, right? And they spread all over the world. And then you ask yourself, um, uh, was that the intended uh, consequence of all this? I guess no, nobody would agree with that, right? Nobody intention, in, uh, intentionally is aiming to contaminate other places around the world. So the question is, where is the failure here? And if you go down the road or back to the origin of all this, is it starts with design. It starts with conceptually thinking about what you want to offer, what service or need do you want to satisfy for the human being? and how you're going to do it, in what way, and, with, and what cocktail of materials or what combination of chemicals, right? So that's why I always love to, to have long conversations with uh, Mark, Mark Dorfman from Biomimicry Institute because it opens up a fascinating world of going to the basics, going to the level of molecules, going to the level of understanding that in nature, the whole ecosystem on this planet that is so complicated when we talk about biodiversity, right? Uh, all those pieces, how they interact, all the processes that take place simultaneously in multiple continuous cycles. And you ask yourself, whoa, what happened with us as human beings? We are fully disconnected to this reality of which we are part of. And then you ask yourself, how is it possible that within this complex 
biodiverse system, they only use a select number of elements of the uh, SI table, how you call it again in periodic, uh, periodic table, right? While we as humans use double of it <laughs> because we have the ingenuity and creativity of exploiting uh, resources and mining things and we convert them in different, we use chemical processes. You're a chemical engineer, so you're very uh, well aware of that. And we create new substances that have not existed before in the combination that we have been able to manipulate it, right? And then we, we don't even question the fact of, okay, what happens next after its use? Or eventually, is it leading to public health? Is it leading to any contamination of other types of ecosystems, uh, services, etc. So for me, that's why everything comes down back to the basics. If we do not intentionally design things properly, co coherently, consciously, in line with these principles, for me, the rest is pure waste of my energy and time. That's why I'm so bold about that. Because uh, yes, we can leapfrog, but the only way we can leapfrog is by consciously intellectually doing that. Not by just saying, oh, let me try to balance out the system or try to be realistic. No, if you really want to go to that leapfrogging stage, we really need to be talking the language that is necessary. So instead of saying, ah, I'm gonna help mitigate climate change because I'm deploying renewable energy technologies, that's nonsense. Because after 30 years, it becomes a problem. If you figure out a way to design whatever technology it may be that is composed of adequate components, adequate materials, adequate chemicals that still can do the function of converting irradiation to electricity, then we have a business, then we have something concrete. Then, you know, we can say, okay, that's a good solution. That's a great idea and that's worth our collective investment, collective effort and uh, research and whatever you need. But if we, if we keep on talking about uh, things that will not lead to the overarching goal, for me, it's uh, why. So, and, and that is very hard to bring about or um, bring across, uh, even among colleagues, and especially, uh, you know, the wider population. Because indeed, we are right. We live in a completely different context, a reality where people are still struggling to have food on the table at the end of the day or next day, uh, have other priorities. They're thinking about how do I make sure that my family is safe or in good health. Hardly anybody has the time <laughs> or the conditions to think about these, let's call them philosophical <laughs> ideas, and to, to make uh, systemic changes. And so for me, that's my, my bubbling not struggle, but impatience with all this, is that how can we really make the leapfrog? Because that is the ambition. How, how do we really do that in a, in a concerted way, in a systematic way, and conscious? Uh, sorry, but I deviated from your question about Aruba. <laughs> but well, yeah. I, I think, uh, Kevin... So we have to invest in, in, in our collective intellect. That is the, po the point here. But I think we also have to think about how siloed things can easily be. You know, you're a chemical engineer, I'm a water engineer. I'm a chemist, you're a something. We're all together in this and everything is connected to everything else. And so your example of the, the solar panels, which didn't think about some of these future other issues, you could say the same with wind, windmills, right? All of the, the windmill blades that are being replaced now. Where are they going? To a landfill, right? Because we never thought about that. Because we silo our thinking and say, oh, I'm dealing with climate change. So now all I want to do is to change to renewable energy. And I don't have to think about materials. I don't have to think where they go, where they come from. No, it's all connected. Everything's connected to everything else. And, and Ken mentioned uh, the cradle to cradle principles at the beginning. And you, know, you talked about diversity. This is why in the cradle, when you go back and reread the Cradle to Cradle book, which was first published in 2002, it's still as relevant today as it was 18 years ago, nearly 19 years ago, because it talks about you have to think about the material choices you're making and are they, toxic, 
are they toxic or not? And, you know, should I be using them in this particular context? They talked about are, are materials able to be recirculated and how do I get them back? In most cases, like you were saying, we don't even have the systems to collect things, let alone think about what we do with it after we've collected it. So there are so many missing pieces here. You know, there's also energy immediately comes into the picture because you can't move anything around the world without using energy and you're always impacting water. So all of these things automatically come back on the table and we've got to respect diversity and respect the societal piece to it as well. And so this is why for me, I, I always want to talk about a sustainable circular economy because I can imagine many circular solutions that are completely unsustainable. And so I think we have to go back and marry the two things, the 33 years of sustainability thinking we've been doing with the, the circularity things we've been talking about so far this morning. And we have to bring the two together and, and we, have to, we have to get rid of the silos. I mean, I, I've been speaking a lot last year before COVID in Colombia, in universities. And, you know, everybody starts talking about, oh, we have to put it in the curriculum. And so now what's it going to be in biology? What's it going to be in chemistry? I think first, for me, I would say, how do you even make your university work this way? I'd rather talk to the administrators first than the academics who are or the teachers right, in, the, in the faculty and say, why don't you just create an experience where you're living up to these ideas? And then it comes out in the curriculum. Yeah, as you mentioned, I think the sustainability needs to become circular right now. That's that's what you mean, and not any more linear as it was maybe 30, 40, many years back. And it's good, maybe it's good also to mention that um, many islands, the same as in Aruba, we import the major, majority of everything, 90 plus percent of everything we use um, for ourselves and also for the tourism industry is imported. So it arrives on the island, but it never really leaves. So that, that's a challenge we have. <laughs> well, it does, but I know which end of the island it, it lives in, right? <laughs> well, uh, one thing, uh, so next to all the great ideas that you, you put on the table regarding an island uh, community, um, I, I, you're right. Part is you know the analysis of what comes in, what goes out, and what stays. <laughs> uh, but I like the, the the aspect of also the the conceptual understanding. First of all, the language that we use. Um, I, I bet that both cans would agree with me that uh, the language has a very powerful um, is a powerful tool. And uh, whenever I hear new initiatives being launched and talking about zero waste <laughs> or things like that. I just crunch them and thinking, yeah, okay, fine, beautiful. But you know why? Because I think uh, that, me that reflects basically that you have not understood yet what circuit economy is about in the sense that it's about adding value. It's about recognizing that you have nutrients that have predefined uses and functions and where um, you want to be a, a beneficial actor within the system. So, again, if you take the example of the ecology, do you ever see a species that is negatively impacting its surrounding in whatever format, right? Everything is, is yeah, the human species, yes. <laughs> but, but when we talk about, you know, the, the other species, have you ever seen any, uh, you know, how it interrelates in um, harmonious ways uh, with the surrounding and then ask myself, why were, are we not able to do that? We as human beings, uh, are we so arrogant that we think we are above nature? Are we, you know, we, we think that our collective intel intellect simply says that we can manipulate and use nature the way we want it for our needs without realizing that that's the most, the worst thing you could do, right? <laughs> But Kevin, I, 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 need, I have to make an intervention there because he, the human species, uh, it's a biological term, but we also have a social entity. And there are communities that, have, that do not have or try not to have a, a negative impact in their surroundings and they live in harmony with their with their environment, mainly indigenous communities. 
but there is a specific type of society that has grown into what we have now. And it's based on some on specific principles that have also helped us uh, reach a point where we live to up to 90 years old. We, so it has its benefits, but it has happened in a way that it's threatening everything that we have accomplished. I agree that. I, I agree to that. But it's, it's good to not generalize, but of course it's most of us. Most of us are detrimental to this to this uh, to our home but there are communities that have had a, um, a resilient uh, nurturing way of living but it's not the majority and they have been systematically attacked for the that way of living uh, so they don't have us they might not have a space in this society that we have built so there's the options to to there are places where we can look and learn about social experiences, economic systems. Uh, the problem is that scaling up those uh, livelihood, uh, um, lifestyles, lifestyles it might be very difficult. So I think the main problem that we have as a uh, as society is that we have been living, our, uh, our way of life has been subsidized by oil basically so now we're gonna we're starting to pay the price for that and the pro so we have to learn or find new ways of, of of living or and having the good life that we have I mean we have a good life I mean we have there's people that have that don't have this kind of life and we need to lift them up from that kind of, of life so how are we gonna do that so that's the that's the main challenge that I see um, Karen, I think you you have you wanted to comment. Yeah, I, I would like to comment too, because there are two Kens in the room, you see, so uh, it's uh, not easy. But I'll assume you're asking me. Yes, I want to comment. Um, Walt Stahel is useful for different phrases, and uh, I've used him once already. But he says we don't want a circular economy of poverty. In other words, this was alluded to earlier, in times of scarcity and shortage, people are very careful with resources because they have to be. But when I was in uh, Argentina, uh, investigating some of the waste pickers, uh, co cooperatives uh, in Buenos Aires and so on, I was asked rather interestingly, uh, what about the waste pickers in Europe? What happens to them? How are they organized? And I had to say, well, we don't really have any. Uh, you know, in, in other words, we have a municipal collection systems by and large in, in most of Europe. And, and conceptually, you see, I think this question of a circular economy is about how to move on some of the thinking. They were asking perfectly appropriate questions for their context. And you would be, I was, saw lots of evidence of them being able to add value with what they were dealing with they had access to resources and infrastructure, which is where I want to get to. Uh, there's quite a lot of work going on now about how to build resilience. And if we assume that almost all of the, the uh, small businesses and enterprises all over Latin America, for instance, the majority of them overwhelmingly, I know the figure for, for Mexico, it's over 95% of businesses have under five employees. The, but almost all of those businesses don't make much money. They don't have capital. They can't invest in a product design process. So a lot of people working in resilience are saying, well, if we agree that effective systems are an interplay between efficiency and resilience, how do we build up the resilience part? Because we're taking insights and living systems and saying it works like this. So... A couple of suggestions that are floating around are, well, they need to be able to exchange more things. They need to add value with what they've already got. And uh, infrastructure such as um, uh, sharing platforms, uh, temporary food store, uh, materials and food stores, um, community kitchens, maker labs, uh, you know, dedicated local 
delivery systems, uh, online bookable, you know, on the phone. These are examples of infrastructure which enables people to say, oh, maybe I could use that waste that's there. It's not been thrown away, it's stored at the moment, it's still okay. Maybe I can do something with it. And so to build up the economic rationale for a circular economy seems to me that you have to add in, because none of these firms have got the capital, remember, you have to add in infrastructure that enables them to do things. It's like saying, here's some tools, here's some places, here's some materials. What do you want to do with it? It's up to you. Too many programs are run by bureaucrats who say, tell me what you're going to get out of it before we give you the resources. Really? That's not, that's, that's a lack of systems thinking. That's a lack of, uh, you know, appreciation of how things really work. It's a lack of appreciation of living systems. A forest doesn't go along and say, I want you to be here. I want you to be there. I want the tree to be here. And in fact, you, I think we can sometimes fall into a, a temptation to think that nature is full of cooperation. Well, I'm afraid it's both. It's comp cooperation and conflict. It works, but it's not one or the other, it's both. So if you like, there is a struggle to find the niche within the forest. And there might well be a struggle if you use the parallel uh, with humans about who gets ahead with this enterprise, who does it best, who gets the most customers, who does it better. And if some people, if there are say five companies using this particular resource and four of them don't make it, that's okay. As long as the infrastructure being provided is enabling lots of people to get engaged in adding value with what they've got and circulating the cash locally. Uh, Gunter Pauli wrote a pamphlet on this or a book called Plan A for Argentina, which I think has got some interesting proposals in it, which is about building networks upwards. Because uh, my final point uh, here is that what has happened in the world, it seems, since 2008 and the financial crash is that people have become increasingly polarized. The economy isn't working for them. They know that and they're getting angry about it and they're being attracted to more populist or, or right-wing uh, leaderships. And so there's something at the level of how does the economic system work, which needs to feed them, if you like, both literally with, with opportunities and a, a rearranged incentive system, circular economy is a perfect outlet for that, and also for people to have to give up this idea that if only we apply more technology, if only we make markets more efficient, we will get to, or material use more efficient, we will get to a thriving economy. So that's, I think, one of the big problems is that any circular economy that doesn't address the issues of development and do it in a way that isn't paternalistic or maternalistic, however you want to do it. If we can't do this by, in a way, setting them free to find their way through things with supportive infrastructure, um, I think we're in deep trouble. And of course, many of these things have been around before. Those of you of a, a Catholic persuasion will have heard of things like distributism in the 1930s. It was an in-between place between the, the free market and deep, deep socialism. The Catholic Church said we should have much more opportunity for people to get hold of tools and workplaces themselves, you know, to be able to be creative. It was called distributism. And in a way, we're revisiting that notion of making sure people have access to tools, resources, and places to be creative uh, in, in this more modern look at a circular economy where the price of technology has really fallen incredibly and that would allow a lot more distributed, uh, dis distributed manufacturing and production. So although Aruba has a huge import of almost everything, as much like most islands, building up a network of uh, tools, places, resources, land, materials, which people's ingenuity can get a hold of, you would see a, a thriving move towards a circular economy without having to label it. 
And uh, I think that's pretty important, but it also takes, as somebody was saying, a fundamental change in the rules of the game or the furniture in the room. I, I know the figures approximately, it's the subsidies for fossil fuels across the world are around $5 trillion US. Now that's a little bit more than the gross uh, domestic product of Japan. So how on earth can you get a circular system going when you're subsidizing to the globally to the level of the GDP of Japan on making fossil fuels cheaper than they should be? You know, there's no way that unless incentives are rearranged uh, and that a different economic direction is taken, that we can possibly move to a circular economy. At the moment, it all is about supply side efficiency, uh, making it cheaper to access and own things without thinking that it isn't actually a supply sided argument at all. It's both, it's supply and demand. And to use a phrase uh, from George Cooper, if uh, capitalism accumulates, then democracy distributes, because it's circularity. And I think some people are really afraid to say that it's about both sides of the coin. That's why they're very safe and comfortable with just efficiency. Oh, efficiency doesn't change the balance of power or opportunity. Efficiency just looks like you're being really good with resources, resource productivity, People give you a pat on the back, uh, when in fact what you need to be able to do is to say, actually, taking insights from living systems, to have an eco-effective economy, you need to be able to have sufficient demand among people and sufficient tools and resources for them to build their own future in a confident way. They need a foundation to the way they live in order to be able to take up opportunities. And the last point is nobody who is anxious about food and prospects day to day can make good decisions. Psychologically, it's just not possible. So there's a lot of work to do to build an infrastructure that engages people, which helps push back the rightward swing or the more populist swing in political support, and does it at the same time as cascading materials, shifting to renewable energies and so on. So it takes a great deal of vision to do it. And that's why I keep going back to that. I think I agree principally with you, Kevin, on this. It's no use just looking at some practical stuff and going, oh, well, that's where we are. If you don't have a sense of the future in mind, because I think it was the writer George Monbiot in Britain who said that the center and left hadn't had a new economic idea for 70 years. And actually it's true, we don't have time to go into that, but they're not offering anything. So unless you're able to offer something, and it will include a circular economy because for the minimum we've got these materials that, aren't, that could be adding value, not being used, we've got climate change and all the rest of it. But unless it's part of an economic picture, and I can tell you for a start, because I'm one of the few people who do it, tell me some other people, who, well, I'm not praising myself so much, but tell me the people who integrate the monetary cycle with the material cycle in circular economy. There are not many of them. Why not? Because if you don't fix the monetary cycle, you can't fix the material cycle. You know, that's so obvious and so dumb if you don't get it that I'm really surprised that we don't hear more of it. Oh, but we don't because money doesn't matter. It's neutral in, in traditional economics. But that's just not true. You see, there's some big blocks in people's thinking. So I'll leave it there. That's a tour of it, but it's a huge topic is about building resilience by enabling people to use the materials and resources which are available in a way that allows them to be enterprising but provides enough support for them to feel like that's something they want to do. Uh, so I'll leave it with that. It's not about Thank a new you. app. Thank you very much for your input. I think as Maria also mentioned earlier about spinning off small project as you're doing in Peru, that's also a way to start, right? Yes, I also want to. Yes, I want also to wrap up what something that I think that is pretty critical that says Ken, which is infrastructure. You know, in, for example, in, uh, in a sustainable agriculture, what we, uh, we, what we, let's say, whole society is community. 
So we change to this, and community means, you know, being aware of many things, or maybe all the things that happen, you know, support each other, working together. So maybe, like, let's say a transition, uh, or a, a, similar, a similar way to, 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 to talk that into this society that we are also working, or let's say that we, that we understand right now, is trying to, to have this information, what is circular economy, you know, to try to, let's say, to, to start promoting these things, but in, a, in, a most, uh, in the most accurate way, you know? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to say that, that community means being aware of everything, understanding, and then how can we move forward to that, and how can we, you know, start little by little also changing the way that people think and, and to wants to support as well to this concept and to, to be involved in it. One thing that I'm trying to to process this the, the whole intervention by Ken uh, Webster is okay. Money drives everything. Please correct me if if I understood it well or not. So if money is the the, the driving force for change, um, how are we foreseeing the next coming years in the sense that? Who are the, at the end of the day, the decision makers? Who are the, the individuals? Because this all ends up with human beings making decisions, right? And there are individuals that sit at a, on a board of a large uh, pension fund or whatever big uh, investment firm, right? And they make decisions and say, we are going to subsidize fossil fuel industry or we're going to go that direction. What triggers these individuals to, to make these decisions towards the direction that we're all looking for? Um, does it come to a point where uh, a son or a daughter has to confront that individual and say, Daddy or Mommy, what are you doing for, you know, uh, the emotional perspective to it? Or is there other, other ways to incentivize somebody in that position to... Uh, change their mindset and make decisions towards uh, what we call a sustainable circular economy of the future. And it's more like a reflection or a question to the group. I, I have no idea how to get to that point because if money decides everything, um, well, let's focus on that and what can or cannot be done. I, I think that there is a certain part of enlightened self-interest that you know it you get a realization at some point that we just can't go on this way. Now, when you come to that realization and what triggers it, I think that can change for people. Uh, but when I, when I think of the work that we've done recently, Kevin, um, you know, looking back at some of the circular economy roadmaps uh, that have been put out over the last few years in Europe, um, it's clear that there's a lot of governmental uh, intervention in Europe that we haven't got this at the same level yet in the rest of the world. And there's money coming out of the EU, which is helping to drive pilot projects and trying things and seeing what works and seeing what doesn't work and course correcting. That sort of you know, operationalizing of, of this thinking is going on much more in Europe. Now, some of it's beginning to spread because some of that development money is coming into the region. Um, but I think, I think we need to go back and, and you know, as Ken was suggesting, not re always reinvent the wheel and start over. We can look at what's worked and what hasn't worked somewhere else. And I think one of the things we, that I've certainly seen looking at those other roadmaps is that, yes, there is, there is a, rec a growing recognition that some of these incentives and, and barriers need to be changed. There are barriers to doing some of this circularity work just because we put regulations in 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago that haven't changed. And we have to go back and revisit some of these and change them to make those barriers become enablers and to change some of these perverse subsidies. They're now perverse. Maybe there were good reasons for those subsidies at one point with, when we were thinking in a particular way, but now we know differently. We have to change these things. Um, so I think, I think there's an enlightened self-interest, but it, it comes from many places. I, um, I had a uh, question. You mentioned that you work for I on a roadmap specifically for, for Aruba, for example. Can you mention, for example, three projects that you will start with? Maybe Kevin can, 
can uh, go over this topic. Yes, but before entering the, into that, I think uh, Juana had an interrelated uh, comment. No? Um, specific activities. Um, first of all, education. This, so meaning there's still a lack of uh, general awareness and, and understanding of uh, the principles, principles of circular economy. I like to use the word principles because uh, when we enter into the definition of it, it's <laughs> it becomes very ambiguous. <laughs> it depends on who you ask, and they will give you their own version of it. Uh, but at least with principles, you can say, okay, those are values and things that we can all generally agree upon. Um, and uh, so uh, the, in the context of Aruba, because of lack of resources uh, and asking what is it that we have to offer, because it also has to be placed within a, a realistic, practical context that uh, it's any of these solutions will only be supported if they lead to the intended uh, objectives. And one of them is Aruba is in deep troubles right now because of COVID effect and uh, you know the shutdown of the tourism sector. So uh, we depend basically on tourism for, uh, for to run our economy. So. In this case, uh, whatever we generate, in this case, knowledge about circuit economy, we can convert that into an asset, a value that we can export as part of our you know, services to our neighboring islands, the region. Uh, what I mean with that, really professionalizing it. No? So investing in research and development, the, the academic preparations, the curriculum, um, university, this whole academic sector has to be invested heavily in it here in Aruba because we have these uh, competitive advantages compared to the region that we have access to European universities and, and U.S. We, we combine the, you know, we have our colleagues from Latin America. So we, we, we are able to bring all this knowledge together into one point and use Aruba as a hub specialized in circuit economy. So that's an ambition, right? We are far from reaching to that point. <laughs> that's the reality right now. But if you, you have to have a plan, you have to have a, a direction you want to go, and this matches or fits within our reality as Aruba. Because if you're gonna say, oh, I'm gonna start exporting product A, and we have preferential access to the European Union, but if your system still depends on a third country of where you have to extract the natural resource or whatever the primary materials that will come to the island you you fabricate it into something of a higher value added product and for the aim to export you're still stuck within <laughs> that that uh, that lack of resiliency you know the level of uh, being able to prepare for external shocks so you, so it's a difficult challenge to balance out and take into account all these different dimensions that are uh, needed for you to say, okay, this makes sense for our context. And that's why the point of community is so important because maybe at the end of the day, and Ken uh, Alston mentions this a lot, that probably circular economy is all gonna, gonna be about uh, local solutions while thinking global. Because the, the difference between Europe and Latin America is so obvious, the Europeans are driven by the fact that they don't have the natural resources, they don't have the energy that they need to sustain the modern society that they, they know, right? Well, in this region, we are blessed with all the natural resources that we, you can imagine, <laughs> right? But there's a lack of notion, understanding that we could leapfrog towards a direction if we consciously invest our available resources, capital, and money, <laughs> consciously in upgrading ourselves and be able to leapfrog and change the whole dynamics of powers, which Ken Webster mentioned late, uh, earlier, in the sense of having a different bargaining position at the table. Then the whole dynamic with, for instance, Europe changes because now you're not uh, the one just extracting your natural resources or using your agricultural sector for commodities, heading towards another region in the world converted, for instance, in Asia into technologies like computers, telephones, whatever, and then they are come back at a premium price. And you ask yourself, what is the benefit for me in this whole equation from 
this region's perspective, right? That's the same thing with the, with the African continent. So, and the beauty of it is that you mentioned the communities in the traditional societies that are more in line or more conscious about their environment and, and, and have been living for thousands of years uh, in their direct environment without impacting them. We can learn a lot from the indigenous communities from Latin America, from Africa, from Asia, from other places, and try to fit that into the modern uh, world, uh, which is another part of the discussion. So, education, to answer your question. Uh, secondly, analyze what we import. Make sure that whatever we import, we know ahead of time what we are going to use it for and what is it, its intended use after the first use. So if it's this cup of, you know, whatever it's made of, it's probably biodegradable <laughs> material. We know ahead of time, okay, we can import this because the first function is to contain liquid. We can drink it and use it. But after five, 10 minutes, we're done with it. But at least if we know ahead of time that where it's going to head to, we create the infrastructure, we create a system for it to allow us to convert this into another added value product, right? So then, then it doesn't mean that you just have to go and throw this into the landfill. You have an intended system in place and you consciously know what you want to attract to the island. So, and that is a whole exercise to understand the material flows, content, quality, quality above all, because if it's contaminated with, with uh, carcinogens or whatever else and you have no means to, to separate or find ways to protect your population from it, you should discard it. You should not even you know, include it in your options for your purchase. So that whole process, it's a whole exercise on its own. It's a whole discipline on its own to just figure out what we would like to prefer to enter the island. And I use words from Ken because we worked so long with, uh, together. And, and um, he always likes to make reference to those are the preferred materials I want. So you're not talking about, ah, I'm, I'm going to be punitive. I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to blame or, or, or punish the other option. No, I'm going to be positive. I'm going to say we prefer this type of material because we know what we can do with it. We know we can extract value from it, and we know it will not generate undesired negative impacts over time because we have the means to deal with it, right? So that is the second uh, point. And uh, the third point is we are a very desertic island. Uh, I say that uh, we have been, we've passed the desertification, so it's very dry. We lost a lot of vegetations. So one basic and simple thing we can do is start simply planting trees. <laughs> basic uh, ideas that, you know, and if, if possible, even fruit trees, you know, in, in, in the city or around the urban, urban areas where People can just take a mango from the street and eat it, right? And share, and share this, this asset. And it has so many multiple benefits of soil retention, quality, absorption of water, uh, avoiding storm water. Uh, I can go on and on, but that's, that would be another initiative that you can easily, I, I don't see it as a rocket uh, science, right? It just needs an effort and collective uh, thinking and action on it to start doing it. And you would automatically see the benefit coming out of it. I've never seen anybody against planting a tree, ever. If I may. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, it is very interesting, that example that you give about the mango trees, because in the uh, eastern savannas of Colombia, there's a city uh, called Puerto Carreño, and uh, they have mango trees everywhere but the culture and the the like the social aspect of it is if, if you eat mango mangoes are for poor people so you don't eat mangoes because they are free they are public and uh, it's it's very sad it's very sad but yes it can happen that people are against planting trees mango trees in cities which is 
Yeah, Irrational. if you put it in that context, in the sense of massive and land use changes and... No, okay, no, that's no, a different it's, it's just trees <laughs> on the city. It's, it's, for, it's, it's, it's just a, a social norm that says that if you eat mangoes, because they are free, and, and because they are free, they don't, they don't give you status. And but it's, The story is actually very sad, because it's the indigenous peoples from that place that eat the mangoes because they don't have access to food, and then the people that are not indigenous, they they look down on them. So it's, it's, and I make this point because the, the consumption side of the circular economy is also very important, the demand side and uh, the social innovation. So because some of, uh, of us were talking about, yes, technologies, infrastructure, how do we move there, how people make decisions. And that's a, 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 an issue that has not been explored as as in depth as in as the technological and um, part of the circular economy, and it's very important because and there is an article talking about the circular uh, rebound effect. I don't know if you have read it, but it says that uh, in order to have a, to 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 reach the circularity objectives, we need people to replace the things that they consume from uh, linear products to circular products. If we don't reach that, if we have people buying new stuff and buying recirculated stuff, then we're going to have more stuff. And that's and we're not going to reach the sustainability issues, uh, sustainability goals. So we need people to behave in certain ways so we, we reach that that uh, perspectives so but we also need to change um, the 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 meanings that are associated to the to circularity and this and circulated products and and practices and and that means that we we don't only need to change policy we don't only need to change um, businesses we also need to work with cultural devices with with the uh, advertising industry with the uh, with cinema with all those uh the media. media that tells us what what we should consume how our identity is created because so far if you eat mango you're poor you're not advanced you're not in this case that i was giving but if you eat something that is important then it makes you cooler and it makes you uh, a better person. So we need to work with this cultural media that the, the, um, deliver cultural messages to start changing that and, and making recirculation, making sustainability not cool, no, 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 because that's another idea that if, you, if you're rich, you're going to be sustainable. And Poor people are not can be sustainable. So, but it's more about uh, changing the narrative, changing the narrative towards more sustainable and more circular uh, societies. So that's very important. Well, I think some of that comes back to something we touched on maybe an hour ago, which is which is language, and um, you know I think we have to think about this word even consumption because most of the things we're actually concerned about, we aren't consuming, we're using. You know, I'm, I use a cell phone, I don't consume it. And so I think this gets back to the biological cycle and technical cycle concept, which underpins the circular economy from McDonough and Brongart's work in Cradle to Cradle, is some things really are consumed. I consumed my breakfast, but I'm not consuming my cell phone, I'm not consuming this microphone, I'm using it. And we have to, if we begin to use more precision in our language like this, we can say which are the things that truly are going to be used and which ones are going to be truly consumed. And, you know, with, with the mango, the mango is going to be consumed, and even if you peel it, mm -hmm. right? The, the peelings will go into the biological cycle and will be reused. Mm -hmm. But it is sort of a more consumption. It goes away and comes back as a nutrient. And so I think, I think we, have to, we have to educate people. This is what you're saying, but use all the different forms that are available to help people think about 
these, these differences and then change the business models because instead of me having to buy my cell phone and now I own the molecules, what do I do with it when I want the next version in two more years or whenever you know, it, it runs out of memory or whatever the problem is? Um, I don't have a service contract. If I had a service contract where the Apple or Samsung or Google, whoever it is, gets the phone back, they have to deal with the next use and the reuse of the materials. I just want the use of a phone. And so I think we have to, we have to help people understand these differences between what we're just using and therefore we can reuse if we put the infrastructure in, if we get the designs right from the beginning. Because many of the things that we might like to reuse, we can't easily reuse because they were never designed to be taken apart to be able to be reused. And so the thing does come back all the way to the design again, as Ken said at the beginning, Ken Webster said, you know, we have to design things so that they are capable of going through these different systems in a different way that allow us then to change our relationship with them at a societal level. I'd like to add something at this Thank point. Thank you so possibly. much for your feedbacks. Um, also, one thing I think, as you mentioned, it's also to do with the culture. In some culture, not all culture people want to even share things, so share objects. That's also, I think, uh, something to do with culture. And also, um, for example, in Europe, Europe, you see a lot of thrift stores or second-hand stores that also you don't, don't see everywhere, especially in the Caribbean, sometimes you don't see that. So it's really also a culture thing. Well, my, my research in my PhD was about that. What, what drives people to engage with circular solutions? And first, what do they, the, what factors make them accept? So have the intention to participate, but also what makes it adopt the, the, the solutions? And I focused exactly on product service systems, which are basically about sharing or uh, renting. So it's use based, it's use oriented. Yeah. And I did a, a, a study in Colombia and one in India and one with people from the US. And it was very interesting to see that on the one hand, the cultural aspects are very important. The hygienic aspects are also very important. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about economics. It's not just about uh, knowledge. It's about these perceptions, beliefs that we have. So uh, again, in, in places like Latin America, Colombia, um, sharing, bartering, they are associated with previous times, with, hist uh, with moments in, in history where we, there was not much abundance. So poverty is still linked to these practices. So that, that is one barrier to, to exchanging. But if it's between family, people that you know, then it's a different thing. In Europe, it's with strangers, but here it has to be with, with someone closer to you. And, uh, and also there's, so there are very different fa psychological factors that also influence, uh, for example, in, I did a, a, a questionnaire, a survey with uh, a toy exchange service, toy sharing service in India, this was online, so. And uh, people, uh, the desire for control so knowing where everything comes from, who made it, that's also a very important factor that influences your... So it, when, it, when you share information about the place where the toy came, so who was the person, the, the, the kid that used it, blah, 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 then that influences the acceptance and the, the will to, to participate in these services. So I think, and as Ken mentioned, these uh, aspects and these models can be uh, developed here and used here, but we, you need to be very aware of the culture and the factors that influence people's behavior. I think Ken wanted to say something. Hello. Ken, you wanted to say something? Sorry. Yeah, um, I'd like to say something if it's possible. 
Yeah. Um, yes, I don't please know if go ahead, me, Ken. The sound coming back is very, very poor now. Um, I basically have to, to just, I just wanted to comment um, on the tension between the consumer and the user and the producer. I've got a lot of respect for the work of Paul Eakins in the University College London. And um, he says that it's a very bad idea for consumers to be responsible for end of life materials. It's not worked very well. And uh, he, he lists five reasons and I'm just going to tell you what they are. Uh, waste materials have zero or negative value to consumers. They don't know what exactly the materials are in their products. They don't have any say in how the companies design their products, yet they're required to take responsibility for how they're disposed of. Waste is ultimately passed to the remediation authority in a disordered and hard to recycle state, making waste management expensive and 100% recycling virtually impossible. So what about shifting the responsibility for waste to producers? And I think this idea of total product liability is growing uh, rapidly. There are papers on it in Finland and in the Europe. Uh, we don't want to emphasize the customer's role. The customer's role is to choose the products and services that they like. And the business's role is to deliver that in a much better way than they're doing at the moment, so that the, it is an opportunity, a business opportunity, not seeing what you can get away with. And um, this idea of total product liability looks like the best way to do this. Um, I don't we think we need to final point because I have to drop off this call after this comment. Uh, the, the final point I want to make is that I think it's really difficult to use circular as a way of persuading consumers of anything. Uh, many people who are interested in it might take notice, but it was the problem with the sustainability selling green products. They're very much, uh, very often higher cost. They're almost used as a moral statement. Look, I've got these locally produced fava beans or something. Look, we'll have those for tea. So it doesn't necessarily apply very well to when the poor are making decisions. So it has to be a lot more systemic than that. And I think the role of the correct incentives, making sure the responsibility is on the producer and providing tax and spend regimes that enable uh, more people who are less well off to participate in the economy is the way that we will find a way through this. I think there's a terrible habit for people who are relatively well paid, like me, uh, to adopt the moral high ground. And I'll just point out America's experience. When people uh, suggested that those who voted for Donald Trump were deplorables back in 2016, the result was that the deplorables won. And even after four years of Trump rule, there wasn't a landslide against him Perhaps Joe Biden is a weak candidate, yes. But the point is, 73 million people are not happy with the way the economy is run. And so we can't join that group of people who are just holding the moral high ground and saying, well, you should buy circular products or sustainable products. Because these people will say to us, well, where's my jobs? Where's my income? How do I get by? What's the future for my children? Why can't my child buy a house anymore? And I think we ought to be able to be quite careful about how we frame discussions of circular economy to make sure we don't lose track of the very serious changes which are happening in the economic political landscape at the moment. A lot of people in the middle class sense just think that these people are ignorant that they are, that they dislike and that um, somehow they need to be disciplined. And I think this is just not the right way to go. We don't want to be hectoring people into making the right decisions. We want to be enabling them to make the decisions they want because they're all good. And uh, I think that's the task. And if it becomes all good, they themselves will become much more tolerant and able to join in with society. So I think 
that, that's that's all I'd, I'd want to say. Uh, I notice nobody picked up back on the money question because I think people don't understand money. I have to say that uh, they don't know what to suggest, and uh, probably uh, it's a bit strange. I don't know if Aruba is a tax haven because the British and the Dutch are famous for having tax havens and very much facilitate offshore banking. But um, I think there are questions around the way the financial system relates to the rest of the economy. So uh, thank you for your invitation and uh, for your uh, excellent um, comments. It really got me interested and excited to talk about it. And I wish you all good uh, luck with the rest of your program. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, Kevin, do you want to comment uh, about what uh, Ken just said? Uh, yes, first of all, thank Ken very much for joining us in this uh, first session of uh, CFA 2020. Uh, it's always uh, a delight to have a conversation with him. <laughs> you feel like you're in the in a, in a seat and you're running like along an intellectual you know, journey. <laughs> And it's really nice and uh, that he's always willing and able to, to join us and co cooperate with us. And um, regarding, um, he mentioned so many things and we have collectively discussed so many elements that I guess the, the one who sees this, uh, this session will get blown away with all the different directions that can be taken when you touch the, the topic of circuit economy. But not even circuit economy itself. It's uh, it's the what he, what Ken mentioned at the end, like uh, what drives people for for the decisions. What what are they really concerned about? What are their priorities? And when everything else falls out of the place, what do you do? You lean on your family, you your closest people, your, the people that you really care and, and love, and you try to figure out a way to work out uh, work uh, work yourself out of a situation and if we could as a society uh, start extending that feeling into a more uh, as, as a community or a wider society and see us as one single species <laughs> as part of a bigger picture uh, who knows this is all philosophical i know it's very conceptual but at the end of the day, you need to have these conversations because that is the, the opportunity we get to enlighten each other and motivate each other or inspire each other. Um, and uh, that's what I wanted to say, but my t line of thought just deviated completely. <laughs> I don't, don't remember exactly what the question was, but uh, in essence, yeah, thanks to Ken for joining us. That's first of all. And I guess we are closing, uh, uh, reaching to the limit, right, for this session? Yes, indeed. Um, we had some awesome conversation this morning. Um, I think uh, we're going to give everybody opportunity to give some closing comments, um, some thoughts uh, for Pat Forward. Um, we're going to start with Juana. Thank you, Rubiela. Well, it was a very um, interesting conversation. I really like the different topics that we touch upon. Uh, the circular economy, it's a complex issue, as we have mentioned today. It's a very nice concept and uh, idea, and I think it's very robust, and it has evolved since uh, 2012 when it started and I think um, I'm very happy to be a part of this community but also it's a challenging issue to, for implementation in especially developing countries so we I think we, we need to keep on working we need to keep educating ourselves recognize our strengths as, as developing countries and, and work on that so we can make the transition, but also leapfrog towards a circular economy. So thank you very much for your moderation. Thank you indeed. Um, I think by making baby steps and then leapfrog, uh, but we need to move forward. That I think is the message. Um, also Maria. 
Yes, thank you very much for the invitation, for being here. Uh, it was wonderful to hear all of you. Also, yes, um, following what you were saying, Juana, is, it's not about promoting only as a, as a, as a passive act action, but also you know, trying to engage more people at the different levels. Like, uh, for example, in education, at the schools, universities, like public organizations, international organizations, uh, how can we change this this concept of, of, of sustainability, but in a circular way. So thank you very much. Well, to, to build on what Ken said in his final remarks, um, I'm reminded of, of a picture that I use in many of my presentations, uh, which is a, an old picture I found of myself from 30 years ago when I was working in, in, in business. And I had a green product in my hand and it was I was a marketing director for a consumer products company at the time. And I learned from that that in what Ken said is that green products is not the right way forward. Circular products per se, if that's your idea, no, it's not that. We should be talking about what's good, what's quality, and how you define quality within the context of where you are. Um, because if it's, if it's just green, it's a niche. And we shouldn't be talking about anything to do with the niche. It, this is about everything in the world, how we live and how we work, how we socialize. And so it's, it, it can't be pushed into a niche. So I, I completely agree with, with Ken. And I, I would just say, wow, there is so much in this complexity that is good. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next few days of going into the detail into that complexity uh, even more in some of the other sessions. Thank you very much. So um, what we are from my side, what I learned a lot today is that it's not linear anymore. It just everything is circular and it starts. It's everything. It's the people, it's the design. It's the economy, basically it's everything. So I want to thank you all to be here at the CIFA and uh, enjoy the rest of the session.